good. If I spelled everything right, we can go live. The question is, have I spelled everything right? <laughs> we'll find out shortly. Yes, we will. All right. It says we're live. We'll wait for John to log in. It's not over there. If I ran out of ink. Oh, Vicki just asked if we're having Bible study. <laughs> They must have just got home. All right, we're gonna we're gonna wait and see if uh, if Brett is able to join us. Okay. And uh, how's your day been, guys? Not too bad. Okay, good. Let me send Rex the passcode, and we'll get started here. Ask our Facebook friends and family to hang tight for just a minute as we have people coming on board. I didn't think to ask the other day, where is Stephanie having her eye surgery? In St. Joe? I thought it was here in Maryville, but I'm not oh, sure. That's okay. a good question. That is a good question. Uh, I was just curious. Yeah, the uh, passcode would be nice. Um, it's the same one as last week, isn't I it? I have no idea. Well, hang on. Let me <laughs> hang on just a second. I'm trying to pull it up for Rex because he just got back in town. <clears throat> um, let me. Uh, uh, get to whoops hang on this right here your passcode is 713-4656-7606 and bible fun with a space all caps let me send this to rex and 464656 if i can type again Y'all are being so good and patient. Thank you out there. We're, we're sleeping. <laughs> okay, rest. That way you'll be good and sharp for the questions tonight. No yawning. Me Seven, too. Five, six, four, six. All right. Good. Or John's loading. John's loading. Rex is loading. Oh, if I had to update something. So. It says you have to update your Facebook. Zoom. Your Zoom. Oh, wonderful. Are you going to sit beside me for a while? Crash your computer. <laughs> I mean, that on there is quite possible. Pay no attention to that man behind me. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll go ahead and. Uh, I think Rex is coming on board. I sent it to both. Oh, yep, Rex is waiting for me to click him in. There he comes. 
Hang tight, Facebook family. We're uh, we're all loading in here slowly but surely. I know it's been a long day for several folks. Hello, Rick. Hello, yourself included, huh? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I apologize. I've got grass on my face. I've been out weed eating, but just came in. <laughs> ah, you guys had a funeral today, too. We did, but it was a great celebration of life. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. It's a great we, uh, I got home at 10 after 6, wolfed down my chow food. <laughs> Dried off. I, I, it was so hot outside, Brex. I know you know it was hot out there today. Yeah, it was humid. I, was, I had I had a suit on. <laughs> I was oh. leaning. I was leaning into cars with my mask on, and the next thing I knew, I had so much sweat in my eyes I couldn't see. Oh my word! So I had to go into the church and get a paper towel just to dry my eyes. And I'm walking through the church, going, I can't see. It's I can't so see. humid. Yeah, I bet <laughs> between the glasses and the sweat and the mask, that would be awful. Right. But we had we had a, a load from second harvest. We had potatoes and uh, red and, and yellow uh, orange onions. I mean, red and yellow apples and oranges and tomatoes and paper towels and toilet paper. Wow. We had we had the load. We had everything plus did bread it, and all kinds of pastries to give away. Wow. Did you get it all? To, I mean, did was it all picked up? We got most of it picked up. Um, gave we had gallons of milk, and we gave away the mm -hmm. gallons of milk. And um, we took we we uh, we took some some of it to um, the um, uh, um, Wanda took some with her to the sisters, so the sisters could use it. Oh, great, it. good. But uh, Mike O'Neill was helping us out, and he wasn't even asking people if they needed anything. He was just throwing it in their cars. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I, sh I should be more like Mike O'Neill. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Congratulations. Here's what you're getting tonight. <laughs> That's exactly right, right? Your prize. Yeah. Good. <laughs> well, we got some folks watching us on Facebook. Um, I got some family members from uh, Buford, South Carolina on board. And so we want to say hi to our our family in uh, Buford, Pat Norton. It's good to, good to always to have you joining us, Pat. We're going to be in Acts chapter 9 tonight. I will open us up in prayer, and uh, we'll get uh, we'll get started on one of my favorite stories in the Bible. I just had to say that, right? One of uh -huh. my favorite stories in the Bible, the uh, conversion of Saul. And so um, we just uh, we want to, in our time of prayer, we want to lift up uh, Stephanie and her surgery that she's going to have tomorrow, cataract surgery. Really? Uh, yeah, she's having cataract surgery tomorrow to her left eye, and then if that go, if she's happy with it. She's going to have her other eye done in a couple of weeks. And then Don's having his, I think, next week. And and so wow, they're just a couple that has surgery together. So that's, <laughs> she's, that's getting her, yeah, she's getting her left eye done and then he's getting his right eye done. So together they'll have one, you know, a couple of good <laughs> eyes. So they both heal from that. And we want to lift up uh, Rex. We want to lift up uh, your family and the passing of your aunt. Thank you celebrate celebrate the life because uh, you told us just a few weeks ago what a blessing it is that she uh she uh she knew who her savior uh, is and uh she knew where she was going yeah there was no fear there was no fear and she just stood up with courage so it was a beautiful day and it brought a lot of peace to her family her daughters Wonderful. had been helping take care of her the last well one daughter had been with her for six months and so um she told me today at the end of the service that as the pastor spoke, she could just feel her heart be lifted. Oh, and that's said, wonderful. Yeah, because she had been so stressed. And and so it was it was a good, good day. Thank good. you. Well, prayers, we, prayers worked again as usual. Prayers work. We celebrate that. We know we're in a good place when when we don't have a, the heaviness of, uh, of sadness, mm -hmm. but more joy, trusting that uh, that God's totally in control and it was time and she's in a good place. Yep, exactly. Thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. You're welcome. So uh, if there's uh, any other prayer concerns we need to lift up as we uh, get ready. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Whatever prayer posture you'd like to take, we give glory to God and we bow our hearts. Lord, as we come into this time of study tonight, we ask that you open up our eyes, open up our hearts, for the learning, what we may take from it with the study uh, in the book of Acts, 
uh, this study by Max Licato. May we learn something that we can use day in and day out as we move through life uh, in Christ, your son. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you continue to lift those up that are suffering through illness and suffering through uh, the loss of job through uh, the coronavirus. Uh, Lord, we just ask for healing in all ways, healing of our country, healing of our land, and healing of our bodies and spirits. Uh, Lord, we ask uh, for uh, blessings and, um, and uh, good vibes going to Stephanie as she goes into surgery, surgery tomorrow. And all those, Lord, that, are, that have had surgery this week and going into surgery in the coming days, we ask that you just wrap your loving mm -hmm. arms around them. And we ask, Lord, that you... Uh, that you watch over them, put a hedge of protection around them and bring them into good healing. We also, Lord, uh, lift up uh, Rex's aunt and his family as they celebrate the life of, uh, of a beautiful lady who knew, uh, knew her faith, trusted in God's gift of salvation through Jesus. Um, all glory and honor goes to you, Lord. We, we give you thanks. Bless us in this time of study and thank you, Lord, for bringing us here as we uh, say thank you to those that are watching us on Facebook. Uh, may the questions we ask uh, build up our, our spirits and lead us into great life uh, as we celebrate celebrate Christ together. We give this to you in the name of our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. 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 All right. Um, so our uh, we're on we're on week seven already. Can you believe that? We've we've been walking through this uh, even though we're in uh, Acts chapter nine. We've been skipping around a, a couple of chapters here and there. Uh, but we're in Acts chapter 9 tonight, um, and the title of this uh, study is called God's Saving Power. Uh, the key verses that come out of this study are Acts 9 verses 3 and 4. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And so the reflection that we have that will end with a question uh, says, God is the great interrupter. At times he seems to sneak up in our lives while at other times he intrudes into our plans. God chooses the approach and knows how to get our attention. No matter what road we may find ourselves on, God's power is more than enough to turn us around. Think of a time when you have seen God's power revealed in the life of a friend, or perhaps in your own life. What happened to that person? How was God's power evident? That's a lot to, that's a lot to take in. Maybe we just uh, start off by thinking of a time that we've seen God at work, God's power revealed in the life of a friend. You know, let's let's get those stories uh, in our in our minds, uh, God working, and then maybe it's our own life. Maybe that story rises up in our own story, our spouse's story. Maybe. What is it that happened to that person, and how was it evident that this was God's power? Uh, as you think about that, I'll share just a brief story. Um, my, my friend Dewana, who has joined us a couple of times in our Bible study, I'm guessing their church is back on Wednesday nights now and they're able to have Bible study. And so she's, a, she's joining at her church now, but um, uh, her husband got real sick a couple of years ago and they thought it was um, uh, Rocky, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Um, but they found out that he had another, another disease that was attacking his uh, kidneys uh, called Wagner's disease or Wagner's disease. Um, and um, he was really, really sick and he was in the hospital. He was needing dialysis. Uh, and, I, and I came in to visit one day and he just, uh, uh, he just asked out of the blue, um, can I be baptized? I need to be baptized. Um, and I was like, yes, of course. And there was a uh, brand new bottle of Dasani sitting uh, in his, <laughs> hosp his hospital room. And I said, you know, we're going to ask the God to bless this, uh, this bottle of Dasani. And uh, we're, if it's okay with you, we're going to baptize you with this bottle of Dasani. And uh, he, he said, that's all right, we'll do that. And so I cracked open that bottle of Dasani and I uh, prayed a blessing over it and uh, offered a baptism and I poured it over his head and um, 
spent some time with him. And, I, and as I left, um, his wife, you know, his wife was there. Uh, she tells me that uh, later on, she told me that after I left, he said, this unusual feeling came over him when the water hit his head. He said it wasn't just the dampness of the water, but he felt something happening to his entire body. Mm. This kind of warm feeling that just covered him where even though he still felt worried, he felt that he was going to be okay. And, uh, you know, um, a couple of weeks ago, Duana, you know, told, told the story that, that Kevin um, got in line for kidney transplant, received, received a kidney, and he's been doing fantastic with that kidney. Um, does not have to have dialysis. And so that's one of those, those moments where uh, the opportunity to baptize, even though the story was told later, I, I, Kevin, Kevin tells the story of a power took over inside of his life. And when that story was told to me, I recognized it as it was only by God's spirit, God's power that he would have felt that way. He would have felt that warming experience. We, we as Methodists, we can relate that to John Wesley's Aldersgate moment where um, he, he went uh, un unwillingly to a house on Aldersgate and he heard someone reading the uh, preface to uh, the book of Romans. And uh, during that reading, he felt that uh, Christ truly died for him and the spirit of the Lord, for the first time, he felt the power of God's spirit inside of him. And what's fascinating about Wesley's story is John Wesley was an Anglican priest for many years before he had that Holy Spirit power moment. Um, that, that he wasn't a brand new believer um, in Christ. He grew up in the Anglican church. He grew up in the Church of England. He became a priest in the Church of England. Uh, so much so that there was times when he was preaching and he told one of his friends, I'm not really feeling this. And his friend said, keep preaching it until you get it um, because other people are getting it. Other people are understanding it. And so John Wesley actually, even though he started in the Holy Club and he had all these, um, these ideas of, of growing um, a body for Christ, it was a while before he truly met the Holy Spirit and the power of God reflecting and working in his life um, from that point on he was forever changed and that's uh you know we can testify we're a church today because of what happened to john wesley and so that's 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 the power of god evident in someone's life so you know with those ideas of stories any any friends or family or yourself um, that you might, you might know that, that God's power has been revealed, totally revealed in someone's life. And what happened to that person? What's that story? If it's your story, what's your story? And how was God's power evident in that? I don't know that I have a story, but for those of us who have been in Camino or other ecumenical movements, we can all think of people who came from a walk in life and through what I would call those repeated weekends and those repeated contacts provided God an opportunity to do a change in their life. And now they're doing, some are doing active ministry, some are doing volunteer ministry, et cetera. And they would point back to events of those weekends that sort of brought things into focus for them mm. yes kind of that kind of that new revelation that oh th this is what christ is doing for me therefore i need to be doing for christ yeah god god showing a movement yes camino camino and the walk to Aeus. Uh, anytime that I go on a spiritual retreat or a sabbatical, those are those are great times for amazing reflection and a renewal of our, our spirit journey. And they're so important. If we're not taking those moments where we can slow down and, and recognize the power of God being revealed in us and through us, we, we just need to we need to take those times and slow down and uh, 
have those moments of reflecting on it, that God's power needs to be evident because if God's power is not evident in us, uh, it, it gets hard for us to um, evangelize and, and offer testimony and be a witness. As Acts chapter one begins, you know, we're called to be witnesses. Uh, Jesus says, you will be my, my witnesses. How will we be God's witnesses? Um, and that's the whole the whole purpose of the book of Acts is to say, hey, those witnesses came together and started not a building, but a body of, of believers, a, a true movement for a deeper recognition of God's love for us and God's power, the ability for God's power to move in us and strengthen us. Anyone else? So in the, um, if something comes up, holler at me and I'll stop talking. So if you think of a story along the way, just let me know. But uh, we're going to read Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 20 tonight. Um, and before we do that, the, the uh, situation that we have is that uh, this is after Stephen's death. Uh, we know when we read a, a couple of uh, nights, uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed. Um, and it said, meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Well, this Pharisee named Saul, he went on a rampage uh, of persecution against the followers of Christ. When they fled from Jerusalem, Saul went on the road after them. He actually had, uh, had papers that was going to allow him to go to um, to um certain areas and um, Damascus, Damascus and, and persecute those who were following Jesus. Uh, he, he had he had papers that said that he that he was allowed to do that. And so they were fleeing and Saul went on the road after him and he heard that there was a large group in Damascus. And so he obtained permission to travel there with an armed company to capture the believers and bring them back to Jerusalem for trial. Uh, imprisonment and most probably death but something happened on the way that stopped Paul in his tracks and so let's uh, let's go through and read um, chapter 9 verses 1 through 20 um, I will have um, David and Carol why don't you guys start out um, and read through verse 10 uh, you guys can share that, and then Rex, you can read starting in verse eleven, and then John and I can finish. Rex, where you, where you, if you want to stop it uh, before you get to verse twenty, holler at me and let me know. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard the voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days, he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord instructed him, go to Judas' house on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias enter and put his hands on him to restore his sight. Ananias countered, Lord, I have heard many reports about this man. People say he has done horrible things to your holy people in Jerusalem. He's here with authority from the chief priest to arrest everyone who calls on your name. The Lord replied, go, this man is the agent I have chosen to carry my name before Gentiles, kings, and Israelites. 
I will show him how much he, trust, he must suffer for the sake of my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scale, scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the, di the, the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. That's a pretty good. That's a pretty good story. Um, and I want you to take note of uh, as we go through the book of Acts, you'll find out that um, this story um, of Saul's conversion, uh, basically in verses four uh, through nine, uh, Saul tells that numbers a number of times throughout the book of Acts and. Um, he, he loves telling that um, story of how he came to know Christ. And I think that's important for us uh, to, to know the story, to know our testimony, to know what brought us to know Christ. Um, some of us, uh, you know, were baptized as babies. Some of us were baptized later in life. Um, but the idea of confirming our faith happens to all of us. Whether we're born, uh, whether we're uh, baptized as an infant, we come to that point where we recognize that Christ died for us, just like John Wesley recognized that much later in his life. Uh, but we all have those moments where we really feel that we are born again, that conversion story. Um, my, mine is, was uh, at church camp uh, right after I was baptized in that following summer. Uh, was the opportunity to go to church camp with my uh, church friends and high school friends before we left Tulsa to move to Sykeston, Missouri. And uh, my mom let me go to uh, church camp in Colorado. And uh, I, I, uh, I had a uh, meeting with the Holy Spirit on top of a mountain in, in Colorado at church camp. And it was from that point on that I knew God had something in store for me bigger than I could understand at that moment. But that's my that's, I think that that was my Aldersgate moment of when I, I was baptized, but it was a little bit later than, I, than when I recognized the Holy Spirit was working in me. And so I think that's one of those uh, conversion stories, you know? I mean, maybe you have a conversion story. Maybe you have that aha moment in your life when you recognized that, that God was working in you and you have that part of your testimony that you can tell people hey, this is when I really met Christ, or I never really knew God until I met Jesus, who has taught me so much about God. I mean, those, I don't know if you have stories like that, and if you're willing to share. I think for me anyway, um, I mean, I, we always went to church, my family, and um, it was always a part of our family life. Um, I was baptized in a Christian church, so I was probably 10 years old on an Easter Sunday, um, and we, uh, we, we basically had the baptismal font was in the front of the church, and you were submersed, and um, I, you know, I felt different after that. I, at that point in my life, I had been to some church camps and seen, seen people my own age um, con make confession. And, and come to Christ. And I, one of the things I was always impressed with at our church camp was it was in Nebraska and it was close to the Platte River. And so um, on a Thursday night before we left for the week on Friday, we would have uh, worship services, but then people that wanted to be baptized in the river could be baptized on Thursday. And so that was always so cool to me to see families come and see their, their children baptized and, and the youth that would be baptized in the river. Um, that was an inspiration. You know, another thing, when I was growing up, we, we were a very small church, but we, we often had um, ministers from Nebraska Christian College that came and spoke. And those youthful ministers that were just getting started, and I think of our own Whistley Center, you know, when I think about 
the youth that influenced my life as I was growing up. And, and oftentimes they were young people filled with faith and gosh, what mentors they were, you know, they really were, they were, they were strong in their faith and their belief. They were young, they were vibrant and not saying anything against our church body because our church body was a church family, but, but those young people being involved uh, were really great mentors for, for me as a youth growing up. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it's always been a part, you know, there was a time after I went to college that I didn't attend church regularly. I was single and I wasn't a regular church goer. I think I always had my faith and I was always praying, but I just wasn't a regular church attender. But, but when I got married, that was so important to me to have a family that, because I, I realized how important that was for a family and for a family to stay together, especially in this day and age, I think church is vital. I really do. It has to be there. Right. I agree. I agree. Thank you, Rex. Yeah. Anyone else? So let's break out this chat, these this reading that we did. Um, if we go back to the beginning of uh, <clears throat> Acts chapter nine, how would you describe Saul before his encounter with Christ? <laughs> a Jewish zealot. A, a Jewish zealot. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> A Pharisee of all Pharisees. He Pharisee, always yeah, I was going to say Pharisee, yeah. He was and hard. He was hard? Yeah, he, was, uh, he wasn't going to be convinced otherwise. He was, he had this shell around him and it's like, I'm right, you guys are off the wall and I'm going to take care of it. So. Right. It was back to what David said a few weeks ago. He was a Pharisee, and he believed what he was doing was right in the eyes of God. Um, you know, so that's one of those things that we have to think about. Um, he thought he was right. He thought, even though he was hard, um, he felt that persecution was the right thing to do, and he needed this kind of smack upside the head, I guess, uh, from God to say, "Hang on." hang on, we're going to do something different here, and I'm going to show you who I am. Um, but as John said, John said he was he was a zealot, which when we think about the word zealot, now you can be zealous in any direction. He, became, he was a zealous Pharisee, but he became zealous for the movement of Jesus Christ, too. So his... Uh, his action and attitude didn't change, but his focus was changed because he still had that energy to go after what he knew was right. And it took this uh, conversion moment on the road to Damascus to show him that right path, that right road, what was right. And so what did the voice from heaven tell Saul about his past and future. I think maybe it showed him in one, in one instance that persecution was, was the wrong thing to do and he'd been persecuting. Um, I imagine after this experience, he might've felt some guilt uh, for watching the stoning of Stephen. Um, but what does it tell about his future? What does this, what does this uh, tell about his future and his opportunity from that point forward? I, I don't know that he realized that he was harassing Christ. I, I, I think he felt like he was doing the right thing. I mean, he might have been, well, he obviously was on a power, struggle or power high you might say because he was punishing people he felt like were doing things against the law but but I don't know that he fully understood what his actions were doing hmm. and when he had this conversion I mean Jesus really didn't tell him anything other than instruct him to go to the city so like you just sit there and think about this you know i'm not going to give you a whole lot now because this is probably a lot just me 
telling you that, you know, who you per persecuted is me, you know, mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. So I'm just going to just sit on that and chew on that for a while. So you go to city, just sit there, chill. And, um, you know, in a few days, we'll, we'll get this worked out. But it was like, you know, just, just think about what, what, what has happened, what you've been doing. And he w didn't really get into what I'm going to have you do yet. It was just like, mull on this for a little bit. He was in timeout. Very good. <laughs> yes. He just had, he had a little timeout. What? Blind. He was blind. He was blind in his timeout. Yeah. Carol, you, know, you said something that, that kind of uh, struck me because this morning my devotion was on Matthew 25 and the, um, uh, doing to the least of these when you do for the when you do for the least of these you do for me and you said something about you know and, and uh, Rex you also kind of said it that I, that Saul um, may, may not have recognized that he was persecuting uh, the Lord but Carol you made me think that um, when you when when you persecute the people you're persecuting me that's the same idea that Jesus talked about in Matthew 25, you know, when, uh, when you, when you feed, when you feed the least of these or when, um, oops, somebody's waiting to get in. When you feed the least of these, when, uh, you clothe the least of these, or when you, um, when visit the least of these, you're doing it to me. Well, when you persecute, hello, John. How'd you do that? <laughs> oh my God. Somebody's trying to get oh, it's him. Himself. There's two of him. <laughs> um, the least of these, you know, when 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 you when you persecute the people, you're actually persecuting me. And that's a reflection on how you're treating my people is a reflection on how you are treating the Lord. And if Jesus and God are the one and the same. When you persecute, hey, hey, Saul, when you persecute the people, you're persecuting God and you're you're putting God down. And I don't think are you right, Rex, you're right. I don't think that that Saul recognized that he was persecuting God. He thought that he was persecuting these people who were kind of uh rebellious against the law. Um and and into something that the Pharisees had tried to chase away for quite a while. And so Saul is finding out, I guess, that his past was not what he understood his past to be, but his future was about to be amazing. Not easy, but amazing. I mean, and, and certainly if you're blinded because you were persecuting the Lord and you have a timeout, I mean, the next question says, how long did Saul have to wait for further instructions from the Lord? Um, if you have to sit in time out that long uh, and you can't see, you lose one of your senses, your other senses are heightened and you're probably reflecting really heavily on who this God is and the power that God has um, to rule over your life and to straighten you up. Yeah, how many times in, in scripture do we see God redirecting someone in a powerful way? Jonah. Jonah got swallowed, sat in the belly of the well. How long did Jonah sit in the belly of the whale, the big fish? Three days. Three days. How long was Saul blinded and put in time out? Three days. Interesting. Interesting how that works out, right? Mm -hmm. Connecting those together. Um, that, that he was... Uh, but his other senses had to be heightened uh, in his thought process. What's just happened to me? What have I done that was wrong? You know, I, you, this, this, uh, you remember when you did something wrong and you didn't want your parents to know and you were just waiting on them to let you know that they knew? That happened to me many times, but I was, <laughs> I wasn't a rebellious child. I just got in trouble a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'll tell you stories when we're when we've been together two years and not just one. Year. <laughs> well, don't you think the other side of that is from Saul's perspective? So we look at it because we know the end of the story. So we focus on the end of the three days. Right. But, but for him during that three days, 
he doesn't know that any relief is coming. He doesn't know that he's not going to be in this condition forever. And so mm. he's almost like, I mean, I, I don't like to equate them, but almost like somebody who has a medical condition and then suddenly gets a great report. You know, when when those scales go away, it's it's new life for him that probably for those three days, it never entered his mind that he would ever get back. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a good that's a good focus because we are looking at we're looking at the end because we do know and like you said boy he's sitting there thinking is the rest of my life going to be in this blindness and i'm also reminded through that david the stories that uh, jesus told tells the parables about spiritual blindness um you know when when you're sitting in time out and you have time to think and you can't see you're thinking about a lot of things well you know I'm sure his emotions were everywhere mm. and there, there was probably quite a bit of fear in him. So, yeah, yeah go ahead. Well, I don't know. I don't know how they can hear me. If they hear me there or hear me. Can here you guys hear John? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oops. <laughs> Sorry. Well, <laughs> I was, I was thinking here. Saul probably as a Pharisee watched Jesus be crucified from a distance and now he's a few weeks later this guy is struck him blind and talked to him <laughs> and then sends him to this place to wait <laughs> so that's going to be weighing on his mind too right well, and he's fasting he's not eating or drinking anything so whether that's his intentions or that was just the way it worked out um, you know, not only is he blind and going someplace, you know, that he's, he's, he doesn't know what's going to happen, but he's not eating or drinking anything. So he's getting weaker as he's thinking about everything. Right. Yeah. And also the men were, the men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the sound, but seeing no one. So there were witnesses. I'm sure they were talking about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I feel... <laughs> I'd be a little nervous. I'd be a little worried. If I was one of the men watching in, I'd be panicking. You know, what just happened? What just happened to, uh, you know, we're supposed to be traveling with Saul. Um, and you, you wonder about them, right? You read between the lines. Did they all just turn around and go back home? Um, was there any conversion in their life? Later, his disciples lowered him through from a basket after the Jews were getting ready to kill him. So they may have become Some of them his, Saul's disciples. Right. Yeah, so how did Ananias minister to Saul? The laying on of hands and prayer following uh, Jesus' instruction. There you go. I like that. The Jesus, the Jesus, you know, the vision that, that he had of Jesus telling him to do it and he followed through. He was the hands, uh, hands of Jesus uh, bringing healing to um, Saul's sight. Um, so the Lord very specifically told him to, to go and to do this and he did it. Um, <laughs> how, how was God's power revealed in Saul's life? Well, from a purely physical perspective, he's got sight back from, from a internal faith perspective. He's now the one preaching and proclaiming on behalf of Christ. That's right. Um, and, and that seems to have happened pretty quick, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I think Saul would be one of those people that you would love to death if he was on your side. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Think about us as a church. 
if you had 10 solves and could control them, okay, right? I mean, you could control them because they have self egos and all that. When they're in, they're all in. There's yeah. nothing part way with them. They are 100% bought into the faith and he's gone 180 degrees from one faith to the other, but both places he is, he is all in. He's very passionate. What he believes. Yeah. There's, and so what, what Kim says is true. The switch is quick. And for him, it, there's not a misstep. I'm here. Now I'm here, but I'm here a hundred percent. I'm not here at 60% thinking about it. Yeah, he, he gets his sight back, and then he eats and gets his strength back, and then he's baptized, and then he's in preaching right away. I mean, there's right. not a down moment. It's He's had the three days to think about this, and now he's ready to, he's motivated to do it. Right. Well, as Pastor Kim said, he's the same person. Mm -hmm. you know, his passion and his... Uh, Determination? Yeah. Yes, yes that he had before as david said i mean it's still with him that he's just changed his his focus yeah but you know it's as pastor kim said he's the same saw saw he, paul he's just the focus has changed right right and he's called saul for several more chapters and there's a point where all of a sudden he's called paul because he begins preaching to the Gentiles. It's not like where uh, God changed Abram's name to Abraham or changed Sarai's name to Sarah. Um, it's just a, a change of the language focus uh, because Saul is the Jewish name and Paul is the Greek name. And, uh, and so it just shows that there's that movement um, because God, God very specifically tells uh, Ananias, hey, guess guess what Saul is going to do, you know? Uh, in verse 15, go, this man is chosen, is my chosen. It, well, you know, Ananias needed to know because, you know, everybody was afraid of this man named Saul, but, but, but God brings comfort to Ananias so that I, Ananias could, without fear, be obedient to God and go and so he says go this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the gentiles and their kings and before the people israel and then verse 16 is one of those one of those uh, sentences that uh, makes you slow down and think it says i will show him how much he must suffer for my name that um i don't know if Saul was ever told that I think he probably was because when when he when he's when he goes out and he's starting to feel persecution really right away uh, persecution comes to Saul and he's feeling that struggle and he's feeling he's probably feeling that like oh my goodness I was doing this to people before and now it's being done to me um, this Jesus is real how that connected him and his faith in that moment um, and the uh, the reflection on that um, verse 16 um, has some reflections on it that we'll try to catch up with and at the later part of the book of Acts Acts chapter 20 and Acts chapter 21 uh, so I want to try to remember as we get into those chapters um, and when it says I will show him how much he must suffer for my name you know think about that uh, Paul does go before the Gentiles and he ends up going before the governors and the people of Israel and the leadership of Israel and he ends up going to Rome um, and he, he's eventually martyred for his faith, um, sits in jail and eventually he's beheaded. Um, at some point he realizes that he is going to be martyred. But his transformation, his conversion on this, this road to Damascus was so incredibly life-changing and powerful. There's no way that he could have uh, turned against it at that point. Um, and so I think, I think um, you know, we always ask the question, and I don't think we're ever, ever able to answer it, but what, were, what would we do if persecution, real persecution came to us? 
would we stand up for Jesus? And we want to shout, yes, yes, we do, but we wouldn't know uh, how we would react if that ever came to us. Um, that's why, you know, we need to, we need to be, uh, we need to be prayerful that we, we could stand up to persecution if it came so that we don't denounce um, our Lord and Savior Jesus. Um, I just think it's a, I think it's just a, a powerful story about what God can do in someone's life uh, to basically, you know, like David said, uh, turn them, turn them in that, uh, you know, that 180. I'm heading in one. That's, that's kind of like the story of repentance, right? I'm going one direction and it's against God. Maybe I don't recognize it's against God, but there's a day that I find out, oh, wait, this is against God. I need to repent of my sins and I need to turn and go the other direction. Um, Saul has that opportunity to turn the other direction. And it's probably the three days of fasting and, dar and complete darkness that helped that sink in, right? Totally helped that sink in for him. And says, um, does anybody have anything? It says, uh, before he encountered Christ, Paul had been somewhat of a hero among the Pharisees. Blue blooded and wild eyed, this young zealot was hell bent on keeping the kingdom pure, and that meant keeping the Christians out. He marched through the countryside like a general, demanding that backslidden Jews salute the flag of the motherland or kiss their family in hopes goodbye. All this came to a halt, however, on the shoulder of a highway. That's when someone slammed on the stadium lights and he heard the voice. When he found out whose voice it was, his jaw hit the ground and his body followed. He braced himself for the worst. He knew it was all over. He prayed that death would be quick and painless, but all he got was silence and the first of a lifetime of surprises. I mean, he did have a lot of surprises after this, didn't he? He ended up bewildered and befuddled in a borrowed bedroom. God left him there a few days with scales on his eyes so thick that the only direction he could look was inside himself. And he didn't like what he saw. He saw himself for what he really was. To use his own words, the worst of sinners. When he starts writing his letters to the churches, he uses that a lot. You know, I'm a... I'm the sinner of all sinners, but I was the Pharisee of all Pharisees. Um, alone in the room with his sins and his conscience and blood on his hands, he asked to be cleansed. The legalist Saul was buried and the liberator Paul was born. He was never the same afterward and neither was the world. The message is gripping. Show a man his failures without Jesus and the result will be found in the roadside gutter. Give a man religion without reminding him of his filth, and the result will be arrogance in a three-piece suit. Oh. But get the, two, get the two in the same heart. Get sin to meet Savior and Savior to meet sin, and the result just might be another Pharisee-turned-preacher who sets the world on fire? Um, so you know what? What would our reaction be to that? Um, which person do you identify with most? Saul, his companions that were on the road, or Ananias? Sometimes in our lives, we uh, we probably find ourselves in different places. But who do we most? If we were to say today, at this moment in my life. Who do I identify with most? Companions on the road. You feel like the companions on the road? You're Saul. I'm Saul. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I'm Saul. <laughs> There's a change in you in the last 20 years. Oh, in the last 20 years? <laughs> Thanks but, for giving me that time period. But how many times have we heard people speak that that didn't have any familiarity with 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 God or with with Jesus and and through some miraculous happening whether it be an illness or or just because they were beat down to the ground because they were the last wire and and something happened 
and something or someone approached them and and they were saved and and they talk about what a drastic change it was for their life i mean there's to me there's nothing more inspirational than hearing that kind of a story from someone that really didn't even have an association with the church you know or grow up in a church and then to see their faith i'll always remember there was a there was a there was a gentleman that used to come to our sunday school and i'm not so sure he wasn't homeless he's had, he had some issues but one of the things that will always stick in my mind was um, one Sunday when he was, we were in Sunday school, we were talking about things that have happened in our lives. And he talked about being out to the river out here, east of town, and, and, and baptizing, being baptized in the river. He was baptized in the river, and he said he felt the Holy Spirit fill him. And, and ever since that time, his faith had grown, and he was, you know, reading his Bible. And it just, you know, he, he really, I mean, he did a 180. Uh, uh, you know, he left drinking and alcoholism and 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 was working and was riding a bicycle to and from Kawasaki and working and and just made a complete turnaround in his life and uh, man what an inspiration you know to hear a story like that it just reminds you the miraculous ways that God works in filling us with the Holy Spirit at different times in, in different people's lives Uh, yeah, um, you know, some people have that miraculous, uh, seems like overnight uh, transformation. And as human beings, sometimes we're like, we, are, we, we don't really trust that they've had that true transformation. But sometimes we just need to watch their life and see that change. Well, and, and I think, you know, we as Christians, you know, for, for some of us that are, that are raised in the church, we've always been around it. Sometimes we want to be judgmental. I know I do. You know, it's easy to be judgmental. But but as I grow older, and especially in my faith, I think I'm not anyone to judge. I mean, if, if that's what works for them, if that's what brings them on their path and their relationship with Christ, who am I to say that that seems, it seems unusual to me, but each person's path is different. I would agree with that. And, and the beauty of it is, hey, we're all on the path. We're all on the journey. And some of us are in different places. And some of us took a few different roads to get to that journey. Right. But it's, but it's all, I mean, uh, God's grace is authentic. And uh, how he touches our lives uh, is authentic. And, and sometimes we just have to trust that transformation in somebody's life that was at one place, uh, you know, um, one place not 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 good and we knew them in that not good place and for them to have that miraculous change i mean what do you think uh what do you think uh paul's uh, or saul's uh pharisee brothers were thinking you know they were they're like wait a second what's happened here or even uh, some of ananias's friends who didn't see the vision that ananias saw and suddenly see ananias hanging out with Saul, the persecutor, they, there had to be some crazy thoughts going on in, in those moments. Can you imagine what Ananias' wife said? <laughs> <laughs> Don't risk it. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> well, but from his perspective, that's a heck of a risk. We don't spend much time thinking about him, but no. I mean, you're walking into the lion's den. Yes. You're saying, you know, I believe in this in this Lord who you've been persecuting and I'm of the way and I'm reaching out to you. I, it's not like, you know, I'm using a symbol on a piece of sand to let you know that I'm a member of this church and we're all kind of hiding out. I'm boldly telling you here mm -hmm. I am. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trusting God. This is going to go the way I, he told me it was going to go away, but like stepping out of the boat on the water, you know, basically. Right. Sometimes from God, I just soon he put it in writing. So I'm sure that it's really coming and it's not just me interpreting. And, and you know, I'm sure Ananias had some of those thoughts. <laughs> right. So, um, you know, another thing, another thing about this, uh, what does this passage teach us about God? And what does it teach us about people? 
no one's too broken and he'll use anybody he wants to. Right. I, I don't I don't think we ever want to underestimate what he may ask of us. You know, <laughs> that we need to keep our faith open to what door are you going to open for me today and then give me the strength and the wisdom to use that to do your right. will. Um, I think we just have to be receptive to what, what enters our hearts. I think we also have to be careful that we're not Saul. Mm, yeah. I mean, we're of the church. We're pretty solid in faith. I go to church at such and such time, and I know how it's supposed to be. And here comes somebody else who doesn't quite fit that mold. Yeah. You know, am I opening like Saul or am I, pers I mean, am I opening like Paul or am I persecuting like Saul? Mm -hmm. That's, you know, that's interesting too, because it's like, on the one hand, we have Saul um, who had this past life as a Pharisee and is moving into the new life. But we also have Paul um, who is the, uh, you know, the, the father of all churches spreading throughout the, the rest of the world, really, uh, and the writer of, of you know, 75% of the New Testament are letters that he wrote to the churches um, and his experiences that, what it, what, it, what it teaches me is that, that God's power showed up in Paul in such an authentic way that he could he could teach with such enthusiasm um and you know as you read uh chapters uh you know the rest of chapter nine into chapter 10 um you know it really talk it begins to talk about paul's experience um taking the time to learn from the apostles um and to study uh I guess he went back and he looked at scripture, the scrolls in a different way too, because he was blind to not seeing that Jesus was the Messiah, but now he's like met the Messiah. And now he has to go back and say, what are all these old texts telling us? How did I miss it? And how is it, how, how can I make it fresh in my life so that I can make it fresh in the church's life? Uh, you know, and so, it, it teaches us uh, it teaches us that, that, that God is going to use anyone that God is all powerful and sovereign over everything and, and God's going to move people the way that he needs to move people even if we're stubborn <laughs> even if we're uh, you know if we're if we're like cement in our in our in our mentality about um, how church should be uh, when the spirit gets a hold of us, the spirit's going to do the work and the spirit's going to move us. But I think it also truly teaches us about people. Um, it teaches us about the obedience of Ananias. Uh, you know, Ananias was obedient to the Lord. Uh, he allowed he allowed himself in that vision to not be afraid and to just go and do what God said to do. That God, he trusted God. Do we trust God enough, even when we're afraid? How do we allow God to lessen our fear so that we are bold to go lay our hands on someone and uh, and, and let let that person have have the, the the future of bringing the gospel message to the Gentiles and the rest of the world? Um, it, it, it can teach us about God's power, and it can teach us about. How, how humans can can be transformed and changed through that power. Um, what are some of the ways you feel that God has used you to minister to unbelievers? Had a had a story today that came that uh, showed up at the at the front door of the church. Um, a young lady had called who was struggling with her, her rent. And community services said if she could find a certain amount of money, they would cover the bulk of her rent and catch her up. She's only one month behind. 
but she's seeking help because she had a she's got a job loss. She's not starting a new job for another couple of weeks. She was struggling and she came into the church to see if we could help. And in our conversation, she tells me, I said, so do you have a home church? And she said, no. And I said, we're a fun church. You should make us your home church. And she, she just kind of looked at me and she said, you know, right now I'm pretty mad at God. She says, I don't know if church is where I need to be. And I said, if you're mad at God, that's where you need to be. Church, you need to, you know, Stephanie was sitting there and Stephanie's like going, hey, and if you're mad at God, it's okay to yell it out to him. <laughs> and so, so we're having this conversation. I, I wouldn't say that she was an unbeliever, but she was going through a period in her life that just made her angry at God. And we had the opportunity to say, hey, we don't know why, why you're angry with God right now, but give us the opportunity to share with you and talk with you. And, you know, maybe you can start figuring out why you're mad at God and just talk to him and give it to him and and rebuild that relationship with him. And it was kind of that, that neat opportunity, uh, you know, for, for Stephanie and I to say, hey, it's okay to be mad at God. There's times in our life when we can be mad at God. But we can't just leave it there and not do anything about it. We have to do something about it. We need, we need to, to confront God. Job kind of did that, didn't he? Yeah. Took him, took him forty some chapters, but, <laughs> yeah. but uh, it, you know. Um, so I think, in a sense, we were we were not ministering to an unbeliever, but we were ministering to somebody who was struggling with that relationship. Mm -hmm. I think if you're mad at God, that's a good thing sometimes because you still believe that there's a God out there to be mad at. What Otherwise, it, you're mad at, what are you mad at? What is it they say that that madness or, or hatred is very close to love and emotions and that sometimes if you're passionate about that, that's how much you care. Mm. But, and so I think, you know, it. I think we've all been maybe, I don't know, maybe mad at God, maybe because we don't understand something that's happened in our life. Um, and of course, as we grow in our faith, we, we just ask for guidance and direction and patience and, and understanding um, because there's things happen in our lives that we don't understand, but mm -hmm. usually um, there's a reason, there's a purpose. We just have to be patient and ask for wisdom to understand, I think. Right. And we need to be more like Solomon, you know, when we just need to, we need to ask for that wisdom. Yeah. We need to, we need to ask for God to give us a discerning heart uh, when dilemmas rise up in our life to, you know, to, to, to go to God in the, in the joys and the celebrations and to go to God when things aren't working out. Uh, just to, to give our full life to God, to surrender the parts of ourselves that uh, maybe we haven't fully surrendered to God. I think sometimes we have those, we, because we're so good at compartmentalizing inside of us that there's a couple of uh, little uh, filing cabinets that I might have back here somewhere that I haven't given to God fully, that I need to open up those drawers and say, hey, God, you know what's here, but let's go through those files and talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Clean up the clutter up there, and so we can, so I can give more to God. I think we can all find ourselves in 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 that place, right? Um, that would free us up too to be able to minister to other people, to truly authentically min minister to other people. But I think we got to figure out our testimony, our conversion point, um, and our relationship with God, so we can let let go enough to help others find that pathway too. I think, I mean, I think we need to allow God to minister to us, to truly let God minister to us and let other people minister to us. I love it when people tell me that they're praying for me because it's like, thank you. I might've forgotten to pray for me today and I need somebody to pray for me. Thank you for that. I know we have a prayer team that's praying all the time for people like me. And I appreciate that. It's important. It is important. And I, and I think what I found, if you tell someone that you're praying for them, and especially if you really haven't talked about the faith, but, but you talk that 
that, that maybe they're going through a hardship or something. I, I found 99% of the people that I say that to, I think they really appreciate it. They, they understand the sincerity that, that that's a benefit to them, that that's a, that's a positive aspect. And, and oftentimes when they're going through a hardship, I think they really do appreciate it. I think they do. I know, I know that uh, when, when people receive prayer cards from the prayer team, they appreciate it. The, uh, just to know that, that, that a group of people are praying for you in your time of loss or your time of struggle, uh, your time of need or in your time of celebration. Because we don't just send out cards when, when, when sad things happen, but we send out cards at celebration moments too. And that's, sure. that's important too. That people need those uplifting moments. I've received a handful of uh, texts and messages today from church people saying, hey, we just found out it's your first year anniversary here. Congratulations. We're so glad you're here. Cool. Uh, you know, that's uplifting. That, you know, and that to me is a form of, of relational prayer. Yes. So, yeah, I, we're still I, in shock. It's been a year. <laughs> well, and I think sometimes when we minister, we don't realize we're ministering. Okay, so, and what you just said is an example, but I was going to use the prayer cards. When we set up and started prayer cards years and years ago or birthday cards, we didn't sit down and say, this is going to be a ministry on behalf of the church or on behalf of Christ. We just said, we think this is something we should do. And it was only coming back to us that we heard, oh, people really appreciate getting this card or this note or this text or, you know, that you were praying for me. And it wasn't like it was a planned event. Now, in God's mind, it was a perfectly planned event, but it wasn't in ours. So sometimes you're ministering and you don't realize it until you get down the road and look back. That's right. God, and God works. God is working in all of that. And that's the beauty of it. God planted something in your heart and it was only a little bit later that it was revealed to you that that was ministering into somebody else's life. That's, that's really how, you know, a lot of ministry works. Habitat for Humanity, um, I believe, is, is, is one of those that, that a lot of people really don't see it as a ministry, but it truly does minister to people. Um, you know, when, when, I, when I get to go to a house that's finished and and have the opportunity to bless a house. Um, I love that, that Habitat uh, adds that element in so that the family receiving the house has the opportunity to go, we need to make sure that we're praising God and we're giving thanks to God through this because it is, you know, um, it's one of God's precious gifts yes. that, they're, that they're receiving uh, a, a, not, not just a house, but a home and place of security safety and comfort um you know that it, it's 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 kind of cool to, to to know that certain things that we do in community we don't think of them as ministry but they certainly are ministering to people and sometimes we don't even have to bring up jesus in order for it to minister to people yeah yeah that's true and you know sometimes that's how the hands and feet of jesus work i don't think jesus went around going hey i'm jesus <laughs> no, I don't think so either. <laughs> he didn't have to. That's right. <laughs> so, um, the life lessons. How do we apply this to our life, and, and who are we in this story? This says that life can be a stunning mixture of Saul experiences and Ananias's opportunities. Mm. Sometimes we're the target, but sometimes we're the arrow. We are served, and we serve. Because we are first loved and saved, we get wonderful chances to participate in the miracle of other people's life change. On this side of eternity, we're never far from attitudes and sin that cause God to treat us like Saul on the road to Damascus. Not far from moments when God calls us to step into Ananias' sandals and walk into someone else's life and so i think it's good for us when we look at this story and all the characters in it um to be observant um to the times we might be saw 
to the times we might be um, the crowd that was with Saul, perplexed. I mean, I think I spent a lot of time in my faith life perplexed. But have there been times when I've been too much of a Pharisee? You know, when I used to tell kids all the time at Wesley in Fruitland, stop running through the sanctuary. This is God's house. Stop running. Like I would tell my children to stop running in the house. But there was a time I also just stopped doing that because I was praising the Lord that there were children in the church. <laughs> Amen. Run in the church. That's fine. Run in the church. <laughs> You know, there's sometimes that we're Pharisees and we can't see past the law and we miss the opportunity to share grace. But there's also times when we can really um, express the grace of God by allowing ourselves to be more and more like Ananias. Letting God use us, letting God, letting, letting ourselves through God be the hands and feet of Jesus. Breathing, bringing comfort and peace to someone's life. Um, and so if we know that we have been rescued, uh, uh, and transformed by the powerful, powerful love of Christ, how can we take that transformation in our own hearts and tell the story and be a true witness for Jesus? What is that? What might that look like in your coming week, um, that you might, uh, be able to really help um, someone who is angry at God or someone who is just struggling with belief uh, find hope in Christ. That's, uh, that's, that's something for all of us to strive to, I think. We can all get better at that, at letting Christ show up more and more through our lives. Mm -hmm. So I offer that to you to think about how might I be more like Ananias and not miss the opportunities. Mm. Not just walking in pharmaceutical obedience, but walking in the love and the grace of Christ. I made that word up, pharmaceutical. John likes it. <laughs> you could sell that. I could sell that word. <laughs> <be a> pharmaceutical <laughs> sales. Don't be a pharmaceutical person. <laughs> but yeah be more like Ananias study Ananias and study his obedience and how it was filled course, with so much grace he actually heard the voice of Jesus mm -hmm. there, there's a difference there well yes <laughs> we were born 2,000 years too late to hear that actual voice of Jesus but I think if we listen carefully God's we can, talking. We can hear the Holy Spirit, yeah. We can hear the Holy Spirit. We can feel the movement. John and I will probably continue talking about that this evening. <laughs> <laughs> so, any last words, friends? I'll do a closing prayer and we'll we'll say goodbye for now and we'll we'll see you uh, maybe on Sunday, maybe uh, next Wednesday, all right? Thank you for doing this. Oh, you're, 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 I love doing it, and I love spending time with you guys. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, when we think of what you have done for us, we can feel only humble gratitude. We can never thank you enough for sacrificing your son to save us. You rescued us from an eternity of suffering and offered us everlasting joy. We praise you, Lord, for displaying your saving power in us. And we give this all to you, this great thanksgiving to you in the name of jesus amen amen man. amen all right guys have a wonderful rest of your week um have a safe four you mm -hmm. also yes yes, yes. yes everyone I told a young man who was excited he came through chow today he said our back seat is full of fireworks <laughs> in the window and said come back next week with all your fingers please <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So true. Be safe. Good. Have a fourth friends. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.